we did it. 28 episodes later, and we're finally, finally getting some juicy answers. Yes, look, we deserve it. But did they have to drop all at once like an info dump on steroids? Like, man, there's a lot to unpack here. So hold on to your butts. We'll get into all that madness as we break down this latest episode, Thresholds. And man, yo, this episode really had us hitting our threshold on patience for answers. But you know what? It comes at a price because Victor had to push himself to the edge just to remember. Yo, bro, you, you really couldn't have remembered any of this like 20 episodes ago, though? Like, ew. And let's talk about Julie. She finally helps us get those answers. But then, boom, mother flood fucking time travel. That's what we're doing now? Time travel? Look, John, Jeff, look, I, I don't know what's going on here, but we need to talk. And if you're new here, do me a favor. Smash that like button. Yeah, I know everyone says it, but I'm serious. And if you're vibing with this breakdown, hit subscribe because we've got goals here, okay? We've got real goals. Together, we're going to make this video blow up like Julie did the timeline. But you know what? If we don't, I'll rock with you anyway. But please hit that like button and more importantly, subscribe. Ugh. All right, now let's get to the meat of this episode. Answers and more questions because this show just loves keeping us on our toes. This episode opens up with Boyd going for dad of the year when he sneaks Fatima out to the shed like a covert op. Now, some people are probably side-eyeing him like, how could he do that? No, she hurt someone. And I'm here like, yo, I get it. I get it. The moment Fatima said, I do, she became family with a capital F, no spaces. He's got that dad energy dialed up to 11. Smuggling Fatima out like she's got the top secret recipe to the good potato salad. Not whatever dark from magic is going on here. And naturally, from's like, oh, <laughs> you thought things would go smoothly. Sure, Boyd. Sure. Boyd brings Fatima to the shed in the woods and she just confesses her crime. Fatima also confirms how she was, in fact, getting controlled by way of rage at different times, including when she was alone with Tilly in the greenhouse. Now, this feels like the show is trying to tell us by having Fatima confess this to Boyd that this is supposed to be similar to what was happening to Boyd in season two with the worms in his arms, which is a fun way to position this issue because we really don't know what it is either way. We've also been teased a few times that what she's going through could be psychological, with Ellis even going so far as to try to steal some antipsychotic drugs from Christie's medicine stash. I like how they've been playing both angles at the same time, but we, the audience, also know that Fatima actually took a pregnancy test. Granted, I, I think she only took like one, but she, she took one. She took it. Anyway, Boyd instructs Fatima to stay in the shed overnight until he comes back with Ellis with a plan. Fatima wants to know what they're going to do about Tilly since they just left her there. And Boyd is like, we just gonna have to let someone find her. He says some words of hope, hangs a talisman, and then he heads out the door. We then switch to the Matthews heading back into town after visiting the settlement. I guess nobody's gonna talk about how going there didn't do anything for Tabitha or get them closer to getting everyone home. Even immediately runs off to be creepy the moment he gets in the house. He's still mad that they was arguing. Again. Tabitha marches off to get away from Jim and that leaves him alone with the walls. We then switch to Jade getting back into the bar and as soon as he walks in the bar, he immediately reaches for a bottle. But then he kind of puts it down and he gets startled when Henry comes walking out of his bedroom seemingly sleeping off his drinks. He wakes up and acts like he was going to leave, but rather than leaving, he just pulls up a chair and starts swigging away at vodka for breakfast. And you know, as these episodes are progressing, I'm starting to resurrect my theory that maybe, maybe Henry could have been abusive. Heck, looking back, that reunion between Victor and Henry seems a little bit more suspicious because it was mostly Victor apologizing for staying out longer than he was supposed to. Hmm. <laughs> We then switch to Marielle heading toward Colony House to check on Fatima when one of the randoms finds Tilly's body. And 
can we talk about Elgin? He's back at Colony House like he didn't just tango with the undead. My man, if the Polaroid takes a picture and it's bloody, maybe don't act like it's the latest TikTok challenge. But nope, he's out here following orders like a man with a clue. Spoiler, he's actually kind of clueless. He has his pet Polaroid on the porch and it snaps another picture and stupid ass Elgin obeys. Julie and Randall are out here giving off some serious high school sweethearts meets horror movie sidekick energy when we see Randall sleeping in his suspiciously messy bed. If that wasn't enough, Julie is glowing as she's telling Randall that she's leaving and he tells her that he wants a thank you. And she gives it! Julie wants to go back to the ruins and check it out. Randall tells her how his friggin' spider senses were friggin' tingling around that place but Julie seems suspiciously mesmerized by it. Randall doubles down on how no means no, and then she just heads off and does her own thing. We then switch to Ellis and Boyd with Ellis asking stupid questions. Boyd tries to tell him to be cool and all I could think about is dang near every 90s gangster movie with that one dude riding with you in the car that starts having second thoughts. Ugh. Boyd then gets called over to investigate the body of Tilly, Nobody notices that he's not surprised and in a pure Avengers Assemble moment, we have all three officers of the town in the same place at the same time. Except Sheriff Boyd is corrupt as f on some Big Mackey shit. He says some sus stuff about taking Ellis to walk the road, with Batgirl and Nightwing decide to let Batman brood. Donna walks in after we last saw her alone with Henry and sees the body of Tilly. She immediately realizes that they're going to need to talk to Sarah. Boyd begrudgingly agrees and... Hold up, is my guy Boyd losing his grace? I mean, I cosplayed as the dude, so I think I know his look. And it seems like Boyd almost looks younger. Like his hair has been combed and the grays that were going down the side of his beard are gone and... Hmm... We then switch to Jasper and friends with Sarah and Jasper putting on a puppet show for Victor. But Victor's having a bit of a temper tantrum because it's not going his way. This is one of very, very good performance from Scott McCord. And two, a great example of why kids need parents. We then switch to Jim and Tabitha and man, they keep having these moments in the kitchen. I guess the kitchen is almost like a representation of normalcy in a family dynamic. This is supposed to be a safe space kind of deal. Jim comes in talking smack about how Tabitha thinks she's supposed to save the children. And then he talks about how he keeps getting a bunch of prank calls from Thomas from Broad Street, who kept calling up trolling on a regular. <laughs> they get interrupted by Sarah knocking on the door, begging for help with Victor. We then switch to Elgin walking into Christie's doctor's office, going through Christie's and Marielle's bags. Still fooling everyone when Randall comes through and surprisingly apologizes to Elgin? Look, I remember when Elgin vomited on him. That whole moment made me nauseous, so I get why he was mad. But yeah, it confirms what I've been saying in the last couple videos that Randall really is trying to turn a new leaf and wants to be Team Mystery Inc. now. I don't know how I feel about Randall having his own Vegeta arc in this show. I kind of like someone on the show having a New York attitude. I don't know, it, it kind of made me feel comfortable. But this trader went and got some sort of blood transfusion kit out of the bag. We then switch back to Victor who's acting about as normal as a billionaire's kid on his birthday. Tabitha is downright dumbfounded by the situation, but, but that doesn't stop Victor from telling Tabitha, you need to make him talk, and then starts getting all loud and punching walls and I don't know, they, just when things just doesn't go his way. Nobody notices that Jim's not with them, and I don't want to hear that somebody had to stay behind to watch Ethan excuse, because mm -mm, not with this man. Tabitha then starts really digging into her conversation with Victor, and he agrees to calm the f*** down. We then switch to Julie getting home after sleeping over at Christie's, and in that exact moment, and I mean, she didn't even have time to take her jacket off, that exact moment, moment that Julie walks in the door, Jim is walking out. Julie goes from shocked to pissed and back to shocked again all in the same breath. See, this is the Jim I know. 
nothing holds him back and i know some are secretly hoping he has a a boyd a man protects his family moment but so far this man is running the mean streets of from town without repercussions or children julie goes to check on ethan and make sure that he's even there with ethan sitting on the floor being all sad julie then engages ethan and look if you've been around this channel for a while you already know what happens when ethan is engaged we start to level up this show is letting us know that something big is gonna happen. We then switch to Henry still drowning his problems at the bar, and and damn, my, my guy is turning into the live action Barney Gumble. Jade starts giving him some sass, and Jim walks in doing a lot of talk. But we all know he ain't gonna do nothing. And Jade seems like he's ready for the smoke. He then starts explaining to Jim that Tabitha came to him. Jim starts giving big, big jealous husband vibes, which Jay let him know he has zero time and less patience for any of that, and he bounces. We then get the first big surprise of the episode when we switch back to Fatima, who's getting a visit from Ellis. Ellis decides to shoot his shot again with emotional roulette and strikes out when he offers comfort, but Fatima wants its solutions. Now, you may remember this advice from last video. Always ask your partner what it is they want in that moment. Comfort or solutions. Just going in there is a rookie move. Remember to be prepared. But Ellis looks out because Fatima is accepting comfort in place of solutions. Ellis leaves and then we see the zombie Komodo lady appear out of nowhere to Fatima. We then switch to shitty ass Elgin showing us that last photo was a photo of some blood and this blood is in a transfusion bag or whatever it's called with Elgin getting another one of those mystery photos from the Polaroid camera. He stares at it like he understands. We then switch back to Jim and Henry having a chat and Henry is giving him some advice that he should probably get that stick from up his ass and listen to his wife sometimes. Jim then gets an unsolicited lecture from Henry telling him how Jim is in the same exact situation that Henry was with Miranda and then he just takes another gulp. Jim walks over and explains that this dude Henry is starting to sound like his dad and proceeds to tell a story that nobody asked for about how he might low-key have a drinking problem same as Henry. Except he maybe kind of sort of beat it. We then switch to Julie and Ethan who are out on the quest when Julie tells Ethan the truth about the voices in her head. She talks about how she had a magical walk with Randall yesterday, and as she got closer to this place, then the voices got quieter, and she didn't even need any weed. She talks about how something wants her to go in there, and even grabs our attention when she references Ethan telling stories about the book, The Flight of the Chromonacle, or whatever and he brings up his quest. Ethan offers some of his main character energy when he explains to Julie that this is a threshold, which is a word that is way above his grade level. He tells her that it's really scary, but the hero has to be brave. And then he offers to go in together with her. And this is when things get wild as Julie is teleported to the motherfucking worm dungeon. Ethan is nowhere in sight, but Julie is in the mother flood fucking worm dungeon. And we even see Julie looking at her. herself and then and, and Randall and, and Marielle too. Th this is from back in season two when the cicada creature possessed them. Ethan is then seen looking at a seizuring Julie who's laying on the floor unresponsive. We then switch to Tapitha showing the most patience in the world while trying to help Victor remember what happened that day he heard Jasper talk. Sarah tags in and says some words that helps Victor remember that he heard Jasper talking to Christopher in the church basement. We then switch to Nightwing and Batgirl interrogating some randoms in Colony House because Boyd is a loyal father who I see doing nothing wrong. The randoms pass the blame to Sarah and even airs out to Acosta that not only has Sarah taken people out before, she killed Kenny's dad. And then scene mic drops on that note. We switch back to Ellis annoying the 
F out of me again as he starts badgering his dad for answers as if he's Boyd's boss. I don't know why Ellis is being written this way, but this man really has done absolutely nothing this entire season besides stir the pot. I used to like Ellis a lot as a character, but this season has been disappointing for him. Ellis is delusional, thinking he can just go live happily ever after in the woods in a tent with Fatima, with Boy trying to speak some reason into his dumbass son. Donna comes marching in like the principal of From Town High and sees that familiar look of guilt all over their faces, like they've been keeping a secret. Boyd blurts out that it was Fatima. We then switch back to Nightwing and Batgirl with Acosta trying to understand why Sarah's not in the box. Ethan comes screaming for help and grabs our heroes and runs. We then switch back to Julie who's downright overwhelmed by the vision of what happened to the Cicada 3. Suddenly, the screaming stops and the three are gone. And instead, we hear, Lauren, oh snap, we see Lauren. And finally, 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 because for some reason, this was the main question coming out of season two from the fans. We finally learn who threw the rope. What's wild is that Martin proves once again that he's more than meets the eye when he is not only capable of actually seeing Julie in this moment, but he also knows her name when he asks her to throw the rope and see that old snap. Julie is friggin' time traveling. Julie threw the rope. She, she, threw the, she threw the rope. The writer said, you want answers? Here's a twist that'll mess with your head. So we have time travel now. I'm down, but it feels like one of those answers raising 10 more questions moments. Where is this going? And who else is as confused as I am, but also weirdly entertained? Martin then tells Julie to leave, and before she can have second thoughts, Martin is gone. And what? What? What is actually happening here? Is Julie hallucinating all of this, or did she actually just time travel? Because it feels like she did because the show took time to anchor her into a moment by having her be the one who threw the rope to Boyd back at the beginning of season two. Again, Julie threw the rope. Now, is anyone else as confused as I am, but still can't look away? She heads out of the dungeon and sees the caves that the monsters live in underneath town. It's in this moment that it seems like she's traveled even further back in time because she can hear the voices of her mom and Victor from back when Tabitha fell through the basement in her house. And then things continue to turn up when we hear the voices of the damn dirt babies. I mean, and, and cooey kids. And then they're screaming. We then switch to see Nightwing and Batgirl carry Julie's body away from the dungeon and she wakes up from whatever the F was happening. We then switch to Donna who doesn't want to sound like the bad guy but thinks that hiding Fatima is a terrible idea and even reminds Boyd that the people in this town are at their wits end and nobody is listening to King Boyd's bullcrap anymore. She's out here throwing ultimatums and Boyd is sweating bullets. And the fact that Donna's the one holding the cards now She's the last person you want disappointed in you. Seriously, I felt that in my soul through the screen. We then switch to Victor and Tabitha heading into the church basement where we see Victor claiming that Jasper was telling secrets and then out of nowhere, the whole thing gets retconned and instead it wasn't Jasper talking, it was the boy in white. And man, man, it, this did not sit well with me. First off, look, I don't like retcons. I don't like getting myself invested in a story or a plot element just to make it all go away with the wave of my hand. I don't like it in comics and I don't like it here. Victor keeps talking and holy crap, he starts giving more answers. Victor says the boy in white was telling secrets to Christopher about how the, the answers to the end are in the beginning. Now. When I heard this part, I immediately thought about how the creators have said in interviews that the answers to this whole mystery are in the very first episode. 
Now, this has caused some of us to dissect and analyze that first episode several times over. I do have a deep dive into episode one, and I'll put the link in the comments for all of you interested because I did point out some interesting things that seem suspicious about when the Matthews arrived. Anyway, Victor talks about how it started with the children and what the people they loved and trusted did to them. He said the children were born in the dark and then they were taken out in the dark. But then someone who loves them told them a story and the story gave them hope. When the children laid on the stones, they poured their hope into the roots to make the symbol and the symbol became the tree. Somehow Sarah blurts out faraway tree and I say somehow because who the hell told her the name of these trees? I know Ethan knows and I'm pretty sure Julie knows, but there really aren't a lot of people outside of the Matthews who learned the name of this tree. Where the hell has Sarah been these last three episodes anyway? Anyway, Victor keeps talking about how in order for Christopher to save the children, then he would have to go through the tree too. Victor said Christopher wouldn't listen, so Victor told his mother. He told his mother what the boy in white said, and that's why she left that night. She went to try to make Christopher go in the tree. But wait, if Miranda left that night to make Christopher go into the tree, and Victor said he found her body the next morning outside the bottle tree, is there a chance that Christopher went home? It really feels like the show is opening the door for the possibility that Christopher might have gotten into that tree and maybe even all the way to the lighthouse. This part I love. I love adding more context to the mystery and giving us juicy answers. We then switch back to Fatima in the shed, getting approached by goofy ass Elgin. We then switch to Boyd and Ellis who make their way to the shed so Ellis and Fatima could go live in the woods only to find that Fatima is missing. Fatima's gone and holy crap, Elgit, Elgit. Ellis and Boyd have no idea. This big goofy goon has gassed Fatima into thinking that she's supposed to go into the root cellar. Fatima has second thoughts, but goofy ass Elgin goes full goon. Elgin talks about how the baby needs her to go in there, but he gets creepy as when he starts saying that the baby isn't hers. As Fatima tries to leave, she starts feeling those intense pains again. And then effing Elgin starts dragging Fatima into the hidden room as she screams for help and end credits. Look, this episode hit that from sweet spot. Mystery buffet with a side of WTF moments. We're getting some answers and I'm loving it but you know they're just setting us up for the next mind twist. Frump does not want us to be comfortable. We now know for sure that, I, I guess Jasper doesn't talk? I guess since Victor said so, but this mofo is starting to feel unreliable. First he said the dummy talks and now he says it doesn't. Then why the hell did Jasper haunt Jade back in season one? Why did we see him in the caves in season two? Why highlight him if he wasn't important to the story? This just gives me trust issues in just about everything the show highlights because now they're also saying that they could all just be major misdirects. I don't like retcons. What did you all think about the revelation that Jasper couldn't talk? This was a big letdown to me, almost as to when Tabitha stopped Henry from taking her to the bottle tree, right? Don't tease me with a good time and then go to sleep. The fuck? We also learned that the Nkui kids getting sacrifices what started all of this in the first place. We don't know who their caretakers were, but apparently they were born in the dark and died in the dark, which feels like these kids were bred for whatever this was. And I guess only used one word for communication like some damn Pokemon. But yeah, these girls and boys feel like they were bred for some dark purpose. Was this information dumped from Victor satisfying to you? Victor's out here dropping lore like he's been saving it up for three seasons. And really, it's like they hit him with the remember everything button. Hey, Victor, look. Just spill the beans on all this dark history. And we, the audience, are sitting here like, where was this memory the last three seasons? It's juicy, but man, it gives you trust issues. And Julie, Julie can friggin' time travel, y'all. Randall tapping out is the smartest thing I've seen anyone do all season. This dude saw horror movie logic and said, not today, Satan. Finally, somebody with some sense. How much you wanna bet we see Julie, Randall, and 
or Mariel go back to the ruins. If not next episode, then definitely in season four. How much you gonna bet? And how does this time travel work? She threw the rope and she made a connection between the dungeon and the caves beneath town. I don't know how they connect, but we have a couple more pieces of this puzzle that are finally starting to give us the big picture. And Donna, Donna is out here giving ultimatums to Boyd and Boyd is a man trying to hold things together. What did you all think of what Donna did here? Or better yet, why don't we just ask Donna? Uh, hi, Liz. <laughs> Hello. I, I, I'm, I'm so excited to speak with you. I'm sorry. A little starstruck sometimes. Um, I think the last time I had to kind of phone in with my interview questions with you. So I'm glad we get to do this live and direct. That's fantastic. I'm going to try to keep this fun, but I'm gonna go, also going to ask some real questions. Okay. First off, I know some people want to know what's going on with Donna and Henry, but I want to know What's going on with Donna and Dale? I feel like there was some sexual tension between these two for a while. And I saw the way that Donna was looking at old boy when he was stuck in the wall. Like, was I on to something or am I reading too much into Donna and You're reading too much. Oh, okay. reading too much. She just, he, he, he irritates her. <laughs> but I think like, it's like anybody, like anybody who's, like, they've been there probably, a re he was there before her, I think, Dale. So they've been there, they've been through the, the bad shit before Void started implementing things to try, like the ta finding the talismans. So they've been there a long time together. So I think even if you are not, she doesn't hate him, but he just bugs, he drives her nuts. Um, but I think whenever you've been, like it's a loss, it's still a loss. And it's just such a shocking, like, it's a shocking loss because because of the manner of the death. So that was what was happening too. Okay. Okay. Well, I know you two are married in real life, so Cliff yeah. is always welcome to join in on this. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, how much of what we see on screen is Donna, and how much of what we see is Liz? Like, I know you're you're like an acting instructor, so I wonder how much do you get to infuse of yourself into your on screen character. Well, I think there's a, like, there is a lot, it's, it's that there's a side of Liz that there's a lot of in Donna. And then there's things, like, it's all Liz. To me, to me, acting is all you. Uh, it's all the person. You, it, it's your responses to other people. It's just that I have to, you go, what is the perspective? What's the background? And how do I feel about this person and what they're doing? And, and there's a... So that becomes Donna, but there's also a way of standing that's Donna. Like, I physically find, I physically found her. Oh, I've lost him. No, no. Hold oh, on. it said battery exhausted. Oh, I've got, I always keep a spare. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she just, it, like, it's like, she walks the planet differently than me. But it uh, it's all got to come, come from me. It's, there's some characters in other shows where I find things that I go that, you know, that I can kind of play on. Whereas Donna is sort of like the me if, if other things had taken place in life and I'd become a different person. But it's me. I like the way you put that. Okay. But I don't behave like her in real life, as far as I know. Well, season three shows us a new side of Donna, right? Like, we see Donna struggling with hope and despair a lot more openly. Can you talk about that inner conflict? Like, were there any behind-the-scenes discussions about this? Because it feels like a lot of residents of town have been on a seesaw of emotions when it comes to hope and despair. Um... I don't think we, we didn't have conversations per se about it as a whole. And we had just a very brief conversation at the top of the um, the season. Jack Bender said that he wanted to start seeing some other colors from Donna in terms of where her reactions were, how her reactions were. 
Um, but that's also coming from the writer. So obviously they've made a decision to start writing in um, that different behavior. And I think it's just they needed to see the break, the, the walls cracking. So I, I have one other thing I wanted to ask. And, and you can let me know if you can't answer this one. I understand. But fans really love to theorize about Fromm and try to piece together the mysteries of this town. Yeah. Do you have any theories of your own about the mysteries? And could you please share them? I do have theories. They, sh they do share. A lot of my theories are my main kind of theory is that this is a metaphor for life. That's my theory, and I have no idea if I'm right, because John doesn't tell you. But I think it's like the the thing that the scary, the monsters, whether they be physical ones we see or the creepy things that are happening, that they're all manifestations of what fear is and our own traumas. But they, they actually, they have now, they have shown up in this show. As, as physical things that affect people. There's so many objects in this show. And I, I think about how objects are haunting. It's not a theory. Like I think anything, we attach emotions to objects. So I'm always interested in the objects I'm seeing in the show. And what they mean to people. Um, but in terms of like, I do think there's a lore there, but I'm not sure which one it is. When I look at, like, the runic type letters, and I don't know where they're... I'm always changing where I think that's coming from. That's it. I mean, if we had an hour, I could sit <laughs> up, but we don't. I can make time, but I know we don't have that time right now. Not today, not today. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're really busy. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Likewise. Ms. Saunders. I I'm look forward to live tweeting with you on Sunday. Have a, have a great okay. rest of the day. Okay. All right. Thanks. Insert the clip with Donna interview. Look, this episode of From really hit that sweet spot. Mystery buffet, a lot of WTF moments, and we're getting answers that we craved. But this show also knows how to keep us guessing. And that's all I have for this one. Do me a favor. If you're new here to the movie blog, please, 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 please subscribe. Those of you who have been on this journey with me know that I've been trying to get something special to happen for us. And I was told that if I reach 30,000 subscribers, we could get more opportunities. We only have a few episodes left and we have a long way to go, but I'm still going to hold out hope. Please subscribe. That's all I have for this one. I'm going to check you all later. Peace.